This is CBC Here and Now. Saw a few flashes of light from across the other side of the highway, and then you see the big moose first, and then we never saw that second one. Shocking dash cam footage of a moose vehicle accident, and the occupants walked away with only minor injuries. Good evening, I'm Anthony Germain. We begin, though, with a workplace accident at a mine in Quebec near the Labrador border, an accident that killed one man and injured another. It happened last night in a tunnel at the Mount Wright Mine in Fermont. Here now is Jacob Barker reports. It was a man in his 30s that was found underwater at the mine site last night. According to Quebec's Workplace Safety Board, two men were working inside of a tunnel when water came rushing through and washed the men away. A second man was also injured in the incident. We're not sure of the extent of those injuries, but we are told they're not life-threatening. The Montreuil mine is just across the Labrador border in Fermont, Quebec, just down the road from the IOC mine in Labrador City and the Scully mine in Wabush. These are close communities with people from both sides of the border working and shopping in the other towns, but we don't know the identity of either man involved in the accident or where they were from. The mine is operated by a company called ArcelorMittal. Investigators are there working to reconstruct the accident. Well, it isn't clear how this happened, just why that water came rushing through the tunnel while those workers were inside. The company has suspended all of its operations. It says to ensure worker safety. It told our colleagues at Radio Canada that it wants to understand completely what happened before resuming operations. Jacob Barker, CBC News. Happy Valley Goose Bay. Well, it all happens in just a millisecond. Dash cam video from Peacekeepers Way outside of St. John's shows just how fast a collision with a moose can be. Take a look at this. Jason Spurl shared this video with CBC News. He saw that first moose dart onto the highway as he was driving along last night. But as you'll see again, he didn't see that one, the second one. The airbags inflated and luckily Spurl and his passenger had only minor injuries. And there it is still amazing to see. And I'm going to speak with Jason Spurl in about 20 minutes. Well, this next car looks like it was in a moose accident. The windshield is wrecked, the roof's caved in, but it wasn't an animal at all, and it wasn't a one-off. Here now as Katie Breen explains. When you drive your car onto the ferry, you probably think nothing of it. You go upstairs to the passenger deck, maybe have a coffee, and you think it's safe down there. Most of the time it is, but not always. This is how one driver found her car on Saturday. Totally caved in. A rogue wave is apparently to blame. The car owner was coming back from Belle Island on the Flanders, the older of the two ferries on the run. She says the ride wasn't really all that choppy. She had taken the ferry in worse conditions. She definitely wasn't worried about her car. The boat docked and she headed downstairs over to the driver's side of her car about to get in when she saw her shiny 2017 sedan was all smashed up. Her car was taken off the boat and she says she was left in the pouring rain. The ferry just loaded back up and carried on. The car is at an auto body shop now. People inside the garage today say it isn't the first vehicle that's fallen victim to a big wave. They've helped with three others over the years. When asked how often this kind of thing happens, the Department of Transportation and Works gave examples of times when ferries had been damaged by unruly water, not passenger vehicles. In a statement, the department said rogue waves are rare and unpredictable. It said the vehicle deck on the Flanders isn't enclosed and that cars parked there are open to the elements. Government says insurance typically covers the repair costs, but the owner of the latest car casualty is still waiting to hear back. Passengers are required to get out of their cars before the ferry leaves the dock. The driver whose car was damaged on Saturday says she's happy she did. Her hairdresser was over on Belle Island. Now she's in the market for a new one because she says she's never going back to Belle Island again. Katie Breen, CBC News. Portugal Cove, St. Phillips. Fall finally or officially arrived earlier this morning, but these temperatures feeling uh, still a little bit more summer like sitting in the teens for most of us 19 in Gander, 17 in St. John's, 21 degrees, the hot spot in Happy Valley Goose Bay, and uh, Nain sitting at 11 degrees today. Now we are in for a little bit of a change. We do have some showers that are going to move through as we head through the night tonight. 
but it does look like the clearing, uh, the trend is to clear as we head through the day tomorrow and then a little bit of another system moves in. I'll have all the details coming up. Tomorrow on Here and Now. We built our streetcar system at the same time as San Francisco, Boston, New York. The streetcars of St. John's were a marvel of their day, a mass transit system on par with the world's greatest cities. Now author Kenneth Piraway is bringing the streetcars back to life in a new book. It was marvelous, it was wonderful. Citizen had not seen the like of it before. Take a ride back in time tomorrow on Here and Now. Great history to catch on tomorrow's program, but now let's head out to Flat Rock where the family of a young girl in a wheelchair is showing its appreciation to the community that helped them raise money for a new vehicle. Here now is Carolyn Stokes is there right now. So Carolyn, what can you tell us about what's happening? Well, Anthony, uh, this is what you get when a community comes together and rallies behind a family in need. This is a wheelchair accessible van. Uh, the Hillier family was able to purchase this van thanks to $67,000 in donations. As you can see right here, it says princess on board. Please allow three feet for entry. So we're going to meet that princess right now and the star of the fundraiser uh, Wheels for Jess. This is Jess. She's 11 years old and she has Rett syndrome, uh, which is a rare brain disorder, which is why she's in the wheelchair and why this man is so important for her and her family. And this is her parents, uh, Juanita and Justin. And inside this community center tonight, they're holding a get together for the community. It's kind of like a thank you to everyone who donated to help purchase this van. So first of all, uh, can you show us how this works? Go. Nice. It's all automatic. Yep. And the ramp is automatic, and you can see that the van lowers so that uh, it's uh, nice and level for you getting Jess in. Mm -hmm. So, what kind of a difference has this van made to your lives? Uh, it's it's um, a game changer for us. Um, it, it's a safe, reliable vehicle for Jessica, but also for us, uh, we used to have to lift Jess in uh, in the van, and uh, that was 140 pounds of weight every time mm -hmm. that you had to put her in there. So this is this is going to be good for both her and us. Yeah, and I guess it lets you get around so much more easily. Absolutely. Before, like Justin said, we had to lift Jess in our, we had another van, but it wasn't wheelchair accessible. It was wheelchair accessorized, uh -huh. which means it had the brackets to lock Jessie in place, but we had to lift her wheelchair in. So this is a game changer. Yeah, and you guys are on the go a lot, right? You have other children, and yep. so this, this must, must make such a huge difference. Absolutely. We're a family of six. So there's always hockey, there's always basketball, something that we're bringing Jess to and we're, we try to include her in everything and we do include her in everything. So she comes everywhere we go. And so why did you want to have this event here tonight? Well, we just want to show um, appreciation to everybody that, that helped make this happen for us and our family and Jess. Um, I mean, the kindness of people that uh, donated not only, you know, monetary, but uh, their time to to make this a reality for us. I mean, we just wanted to, you know, show everybody this is this is what community does when, mm -hmm. when they decide to get together and do something. Okay, thanks so much. And uh, we're gonna head on inside. Uh, a few people on the go inside the community center for this event. And a little bit later, we're gonna speak with you guys again about uh, all of the fundraising efforts, including uh, a fundraising effort that you may recall, a certain local musician with a really big bushy beard uh, shaved it off to help uh, raise money for uh, Jess here. So we'll get into that a bit later in the show. Back to you, Anthony. All right, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Carolyn. So we'll be heading back out there for uh, more on the story a little bit later on Here and Now. Other news now, an Englishman who was responsible for a flight diversion to Goose Bay has been sentenced to time served. 31-year-old Edward Myhill threatened to kill the flight attendant and everyone else on the plane when the crew stopped serving him drinks. And according to court documents, Myhill got drunk three hours into a flight from London to Chicago. He had to be restrained in his seat until the plane actually got to the ground. And while he was in custody in Happy Valley Goose Bay, he told the police that he was in fact in Chicago for a wedding and he asked them to call him an Uber to take him home. 
Four fishermen were rescued from their lifeboat after they had to leave their sinking vessel early this morning. This happened at about 80 kilometers southeast of St. Pierre Miquelon. The St. John's Maritime Rescue Subcenter got that call at around 1.30 from the vessel. The vessel's name is Lawn Bay Pride. Well, search and rescue personnel from bases in Gander and Greenwood, Nova Scotia, they responded. The men were hoisted from a life raft to safety and then taken to Marystown. Nobody was injured. Well, now to a story from the West Coast. Five months ago, police in Cornerbrook overhauled the way that they deal with mental health calls. And so they introduced a program that was already showing signs of success in St. John's as well as other parts of the province. So instead of responding with sirens and blaring lights and flashing, they decide to make a quiet approach with health care workers in tow. Here now is Troy Turner with that story. 170 calls. That's 170 times police in Cornerbrook have teamed up with healthcare professionals to help people in crisis. The mobile crisis unit responds to calls concerning mental health issues. Officers work with experts like nurses and social workers to come up with a plan on the spot. It gives frontline staff the discretion to help the people in crisis as they see fit. We're getting positive comments even from the community. People have utilized the service. Um, they're enjoying that we're on marked cars, plainclothes officers, so we can be out in the community and nobody really knows that there's a situation on the go. Sweet Apple says the work is rewarding because she gets to help people when they need it most. And that helps keep people safe and can even keep some people out of jail. I like everything about the job. Mental health has been my background for almost 10 years now, so there's really everything about it and you're going to the person at the moment of the crisis to the area where they are located to give them the best possible services that they need at that time. The RNC has been working on the project for years. Chief Joe Boland says the value is obvious. This is one of the best initiatives that I've seen in 37 years in policing. It's going to have the greatest impact on our communities, on persons in crisis, their families, loved ones and our officers and frontline uh, you know, health care uh, providers. So what's next for the RNC and mobile crisis response? Well, according to Chief Bowen, about 20% of the force is trained right now. His goal in the foreseeable future, have all 100%, all officers trained for this kind of work. Troy Turner, CBC News, Cornerbrook. Well, there's a celebratory tone coming from this year's St. John's International Women's Film Festival. It's marking a major milestone, three decades of supporting and promoting women in film. And it's celebrating its own role in advancing the careers of women in film from this province and elsewhere in the country. Here now, Cease here with that story. So here is the 30th, the 30th St. John's International Women's Film Festival. <laughs> Women's Film Festival. It's time to break out the cake. Local organizers unveil details of this year's festival today, a legacy celebration of producing women filmmakers. The St. John's International Women's Film Festival started back in 1989 with a single event. And now it has evolved into a five-day showcase attended by thousands. It gets credit for helping to launch the careers of women writers, directors, and producers in Canadian film and television. It's a place for them to show their work and to collaborate on new projects with potential partners. And it's had an enormous contribution to the growth of this industry. The festival also helps emerging filmmakers by putting them in the same room with industry decision makers during workshops, forums, panels and pitch sessions. We're celebrating and also trying to promote and encourage and help facilitate the advancement of local artists. And we've had an incredible track record with it too. Some of the biggest you know, uh, feature films, for example, that have come up here in the last 30 years, they were first pitched at our festival or the relationships that have been made or helping people um, connect face to face with the people who can help launch your careers instead of an email you know, or a phone call. The Alt Hotel in downtown St. John's is the HQ for this year's event, taking place from October 16th to the 20th. The lineup includes features, shorts, and documentaries from not only local filmmakers, but Canadian and international filmmakers, too. Cease here, CBC News, St. John's. Well, you can see the busted windshield as well as the deployed airbag. This is what happens when a car traveling 100 kilometers an hour smashes into a moose. We'll talk to the man who walked away from this accident.
Welcome back. A little uh, weather-related science to get to first. Yeah, scientists in Norway call changes to that country's northern ice cap profound and alarming. A top researcher says that the impact of the rising ocean temperature will be felt around the world. Human-induced climate change is uh, real. It is obvious here in the Arctic. It is important that we take that uh, into our minds and uh, assume responsibility for what we're doing to the planet. Holman says a 10 degree increase in 30 years is significant. Yeah, it and it means the glaciers are melting so quickly, the Arctic landscape is being permanently changed. And in Austria, scientists predict that there's not going to be any ice left on the Alps. This is amazing. When the children wow. born today become adults, there won't be any of the ice on the mountain tops, which date back about 5,000 years. Makes you kind of think. It really does. Yeah, especially with all those, uh, I think on here and now, we talked about those protests all around the world mm -hmm. on Friday. It's a uh, big conversation. Millions of people, so obviously global warming. It's big. Yeah, yeah. it's a big conversation. Absolutely, it is uh, anywhere around the world. Yeah, <laughs> and we'll have more about that uh, later in here and now. Now, for reasonable warming, uh, <laughs> you mentioned earlier, it's fall. Yes. But it feels pretty nice. It's, Summer's not letting go. It's not letting go. Hey, yeah. we won't let it, we don't want to let it go. Not me. <laughs> At least I don't. Uh, let's take a look at the temperatures that we saw today. 17 degrees, 19 in Gander. Feels a little bit warmer as well with uh, a little bit of that humidity in the air. And uh, the hot spot was Happy Valley Goose Bay, reached a high near 21 degrees. Now, those temperatures are still pretty similar to uh, what we saw uh, this afternoon, still 17 degrees. In St. John's, you can see that uh, generally southerly flow, and that's why we're seeing some of these warmer temperatures. Happy Valley Goose Bay has dropped down to about 15 degrees right now. But boy, uh, the temperatures may not feel like fall, but these winds certainly do. Uh, top gusts this morning, St. John's 80 kilometers per hour, 67 in Twilling Gate, uh, Rocky Harbor saw a wind gust near 63 kilometers per hour. Now those winds still strong. These are the currently current sustained winds about 44 kilometers per hour uh, for St. John's 26 for Gander. And you can see again that west generally southwest flow uh, with wind uh, winds gusting upwards of about 40 to 60 kilometers per hour up through Makovic. Those are out of the uh, northwest gusting upwards of about 60 kilometers per hour. So here's a look at the satellite radar. Not a whole lot happening right now. Just plenty of cloud cover moving in. And uh, if we zoom out, we can see some showers moving through the maritime provinces. That's what uh, is on tap as we head through the night tonight. Generally going to skirt the southern half of the island, though. So uh, I'd say Buren Peninsula, the Avalon, and then a little bit of shower activity possible for Bonavista North and the Bonavista Peninsula. And then again, hanging on to that chance of showers for central Labrador and coastal Labrador. You can see some of that blue showing up. That will likely be snow up in the uh, higher elevations, mountainous areas uh, through the uh, overnight tonight. Otherwise, we should see some generally clearing trend for the west coast. As those winds shift, uh, going to start to see more northerly winds uh, through the night, but generally light for the most part. Those winds are going to stay strong, though, for the Avalon, anywhere really along the northeast coast, upwards of about 50 kilometers per hour. So similar to what we're seeing right now. 15 degrees, the overnight low tonight for St. John's. Otherwise, we're going to dip into the single digits. As we start to see those clearing skies, those lower lying areas may, uh, may see some patchy frost. 10 degrees for Port Basque, 13 for Marystown, again with that chance of showers on tap tonight. Up through Labrador, generally clearing trend uh, for Happy Valley Goose Bay. Nain, 5 degrees tonight. Lab City sitting around zero. Slight chance of some showers within the next couple of hours, I'd say. Then we should see some clearing through the day. Otherwise, tomorrow, first half of the day actually looks quite nice. Maybe some lingering drizzle uh, for the northern portions of the Avalon, but then we'll start to see some increase in cloud. Labrador is actually going to stay quite nice, but increasing cloud and showers moving in through the day for most of the island and those temperatures are going to drop from what we're seeing today. So I have 10 degrees in there for St. John's. That morning high of 15 will uh, drop through the day. So you're certainly going to need a jacket once you get home from work tomorrow evening. Uh, northerly winds 20 to 30 kilometers per hour. Again, we can thank that wind shift for those cooler temperatures. 14 degrees for Clarenville, staying in that uh, 12 to 14 degree range for Central. A little bit warmer along the West Coast, but again, the showers moving in through the day. Plenty of sunshine for the Northern Peninsula. Six degrees for Cartwright tomorrow, so much cooler than today. 
and then we've got that sunshine for the rest of Labrador. So that's a look at your forecast. We'll look ahead to uh, the middle of the week when I come back. You are looking at what happens to a car when it's traveling at 100 kilometers an hour and hits a moose. The person who dro was driving that car is Jason Spurl, who joins me right here. Jason, where were you going? Uh, we were heading back to town, uh, to Paradise, uh, after visiting our in-laws out in Holyrood and just driving along uh, by Fox Trap Access Road. And what were the driving conditions like at the time? Uh, 15 degrees, clear, <laughs> dry, you know, great driving conditions for the highway. Now, we have seen from the video that you caught what this was like, but give me a sense of your, your driver's reactions. What, what was happening in the moments before the moose appeared? Um, just before, <laughs> we saw a few flashes of light from across the other side of the highway, and we <laughs> Someone flash your lights and you slow down and then you see the big moose first and then we never saw that second one and that's when we hit it and the explosion from the airbags and just the smash of of a moose hitting your windshield in the front of your vehicle is just amazing <laughs> you know what, what, what did it sound like just like a Hollywood movie when you see those movies where someone bangs into a wall or t-bones another vehicle and that ringing that they play in someone's ears that's exactly what it felt like was there a moment where you know they say sometimes time seems to slow down was there any of that how did you because you were actually driving with somebody right how, how are you sort of checking what's happening and figuring out how'd you process this I, I honestly don't know i think it was mostly adrenaline uh i was a driver and my partner was the passenger and i remember just when we came through uh putting it in park turning it off getting the hazard lights on uh getting out of the vehicle you know, going over to the passenger side to make sure that just to get out of the vehicle because it was dark, uh, traffic was oncoming, so the risk of someone hitting us again or something like that would uh, definitely be there. So after you smashed into the moose, was the car just sort of stuck there on the road or were you off to the side? We were almost in the median, and uh, so when you came out of the, pa the driver's side, uh, it had to go down into the ditch and then come back up to get to get around the back of her. All right. Well, let me ask you this. When you take a look at what we see here, this vehicle, are you... Are you surprised that you just sort of walked away with a, a bruised wrist and, and your partner's stomach is a little bit bruised? Are you surprised? Very surprised. Uh, you know, growing up in Newfoundland Labrador, you see a lot of moose accidents on the news and on, on the internet. And to see the damage that's here and where the headlight's supposed to be on the driver's side um, and to only get a few marks is definitely amazing. So since the accident happened, do you find yourself kind of reliving it at all or saying, wow, that was close? Or uh, how does it sort of affect your thinking, if at all? Well, I mean, definitely he'd probably be a bit more cautious when driving. Um, you know, I always found myself a good, cautious driver. But, uh, you know, we, I obviously have the dashboard camera uh, that everyone has seen. So, you know, I'm after looking at that probably about a thousand times, trying to overanalyze what could I have done different if I was going one kilometer faster, one kilometer less. So definitely, um, you know, that helps you relive it too. Right. Last question for you. Uh, sense of gratitude? Do you feel like a lucky guy? Or, you know, how do you make sense of one of these random acts that happens in, in Newfoundland, Labrador, on our highways? Uh, just so random, maybe somebody up above was watching us and uh, taking care of us when we hit those, that moose. Yeah, I actually noticed looking around here, there's little bits of uh, moose fur that are still actually in the, in the hood. Yeah. yeah, definitely there. We couldn't take the moose, but, you know, uh, but I mean, it's it's definitely I, I can't even explain. I, I just I even get like anxious now just talking about it. Yeah, no doubt. Well, listen, I'm glad you're relatively uninjured, other than a minor pain to your wrist. And uh, thanks a lot for your time. No problem. Thank you. Well, this wheelchair accessible van has been a game changer for one grateful Flat Rock family. They're holding a get together tonight in the community center to say thank you to everyone who helped fundraise. Coming up, we'll head on inside and find out more about the fundraising efforts.
just get that call. That call, it changes your life forever. That's when they told me that she had meningitis. This is my story, a special series on Here and Now. Well, I heard I was a diabetic with no pills, and the third day I said, well, what am I going to do? She accepted the DNA and she started to generate her own blood cells and it was amazing. We're checking back in with people who have faced some major life challenges to see where they are today. I'm looking towards going back to school and finish my book I'm writing. He definitely don't pick berries. No, I, I don't anymore. go picking berries anymore. No. More segments airing this fall on Here and Now. And this is my story. Well, as you can see, Carolyn Stokes, not right here. She's in Flat Rock, where a family is saying thank you tonight to the community that helped them raise enough money to buy a wheelchair accessible van for their young daughter, Jess. So, Carolyn, what's going on now? Well, Anthony, earlier in the show, I was outdoors with that uh, brand new van. Uh, and now I'm inside where there's a bit of a party happening. A little thank you to all of the people who helped raise money for this, uh, this wheelchair accessible van. $67,000 raised to help pay for that van. So as you can see, lots of people just kind of milling about and uh, having some sandwiches and some drinks and stuff like that. And uh, with me right now is the Hillier family or most of the Hillier family anyways, including Jess. This is 11-year-old Jess. The van was purchased uh, for her, and this is her parents, Juanita and Justin. So uh, first of all, can you talk a bit about the fundraising efforts? How much work went into raising all of that money to buy that van? Sure. Well, we started fundraising last July, um, and we've had everything from little kids in the community having lemonade stands um, to people having birthday parties and donating their birthday money to Jess. Um, Chris Andrews from Shandiganok has mm -hmm. been a big supporter and Kevin Parsons, our MHA, has been a big supporter to us. And um, so we had a concert for Jess. We've had a softball tournament. We've had a little bit of everything. Wow. And Chris Andrews, I know that made a bit of news uh, when he uh, decided to shave off his beard as a fundraiser uh, for that. What, what did you think when he came to you with, with that idea? <laughs> well, for me, it is like shave for the brave. I mean, it, that, that was our shave for the brave. And then Chris decided to do that. I mean, that's, that's really giving of yourself. I mean, to, to give up something that was so personal to him to help uh, give something back to Jess. Yeah, uh, and they raised a lot of money from that, didn't they? Absolutely. Uh, it was 23,000. 20, 23,000, yeah. 23, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so this man really makes a huge difference for your lives, helps you get around because Jess, uh, as I mentioned, does have Rett syndrome. Can you explain to the folks at home exactly what that is? Sure. Rett syndrome is a neurodevelopmental disorder. So it's a gene mutation. Um, it's one in every 12 to 10 to 12,000 uh, live female births will have Rett syndrome. It's rare, but it's not so rare. And um, you know, in Newfoundland, I think there's maybe seven girls that I know of with Rett syndrome in Newfoundland. And uh, it's a wide range of disabilities. Mm -hmm. And um, Jessie has quite a few of those, but she's a happy little girl. She uh, hasn't been smiling much tonight because she's tired. But if Chris Andrews <laughs> was here, she always gives him a smile, oh, always. <laughs> yeah. So um, October is Rett Syndrome Awareness Month, and um, our family, along with another family in uh, our community, is holding a Purple Light Campaign fundraiser, and that's okay. all this stuff back here. Okay. And so what we ask of family and friends and everyone else in the community is to purchase a Purple Light bulb, and uh, they're handmade by me and Justin, mm -hmm. and we ask everyone to light the night on October 29th and send us pictures and we flood Facebook with purple lights and that's all over Canada. Mm -hmm. And um, there's another little girl that we're really close with. Her name is Raya and she's uh, just recently diagnosed and she's also going to be doing it with Jess this year. Okay. So. so October 29th and next month, the entirety of the month is Rett Syndrome Awareness Month. But when you see those purple lights on October 29th, now you'll know why they're turned on for sure. Thank you so much, guys, and uh, congratulations on, on getting the van and uh, to everyone here for helping out. Yeah, thank you, guys. A big thank you to everyone for coming tonight. Back to you, Anthony. All right, thanks, Karen. So obviously some nice applause and cheers uh, out there in Flat Rock. Uh, very nice gesture from the family.
Conservative Party leader Andrew Scheer made a stop in St. John's yesterday. Details about his visit and a look at where the other leaders were campaigning today. Conservative Party leader Andrew Scheer made a campaign stop in St. John's last night. Scheer spent about an hour campaigning for Jody Wall, the Conservative candidate who's running in St. John's East. This was at a gathering and Scheer told the crowd that he's been hearing that people in Atlantic Canada want change. And he promised once again to scrap the carbon tax along with other taxes. And when asked about mitigating electricity rates as a result of Muskrat Falls, Scheer told reporters that he will continue talks with the government. We are talking about uh, putting forward uh, spe uh, specific measures as it relates to greening the grid. It's part of our environmental platform. That's a, a general application across Canada. Uh, but I will, of course, be uh, working in a constructive and collaborative way with the Premier of Newfoundland and Labrador uh, to address many of the issues that, that are affecting the people of this province. Now, Scheer moved on to Ontario today, where the battle for votes in key ridings was on full display as both he and Justin Trudeau campaigned in densely populated ridings in Ontario. Right now, there are Canadians who are facing impossible choices between their groceries and their medication. In a Hamilton Health Centre, Liberal leader Justin Trudeau promised that a re-elected Liberal government would introduce a national pharmacare program, but he didn't say how much that might cost or when it would happen. He did promise an initial investment of $6 billion for pharmacare and other health initiatives. Conservative leader Andrew Scheer promised to make it easier for Canadians to buy their first home by allowing longer mortgages. He made that announcement in a fast-growing Vaughan, that's a community just north of Toronto. Scheer also said that he would review the mortgage stress test, a measure brought in last year to ensure that Canadians don't take on more debt than they can afford. NDP leader Jagmeet Singh touched down in New Brunswick for the first time since becoming leader. He apologized for that and announced Danielle Thériault as his new candidate in the riding of Acadie Bathurst. The riding was held by the NDP for nearly two decades before the Liberals won in 2015. Green leader Elizabeth May is in Atlantic Canada as well, the party hoping to make a breakthrough on October the 21st. In Fredericton, she announced a plan to expand mental health and rehabilitation services, particularly in rural areas. 
Well, an international story now with ties to this province. The Netherlands is nearing its 75th anniversary of being liberated. And the country is honouring Canada's participation in ending the Second World War. The Dutch ambassador to Canada presented Newfoundland and Labrador with 750 tulips over the weekend. And those flowers will be planted at the Lieutenant Governor's house. The ambassador says the country still appreciates the sacrifices that Canadians made decades ago. For us, uh, having been liberated by the Canadian is, 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 is very important and it goes very deep to our hearts. I'll tell you a personal story. My mother was born in 1932, so she was 13 years old at the time of the liberation. And she told me, when I was a kid, she told me the stories about her standing you know, at the roadside when the Canadians were coming in to liberate the city where she was living at the time. And uh, 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 they had been under, under a Nazi occupation for five years. So for them, that was a, a momentous occasion. Glad to see that my grandfather was part of that liberation. Now, this is just part of a larger gift from the Netherlands to Canada. 1,100,000 tulip bulbs will be planted coast to coast to bloom next spring. And now to a story from our colleagues at Go Public. Canadians use e-transfers to send money about 1 million times a day. Now, the banks say it's secure and that customers are protected. But dozens of people tell CBC News that they have lost thousands of dollars to fraudsters and that the banks are blaming the customers for those losses. CBC's Erica Johnson has that story. Rene Trudeau hired a contractor to install a new front door, then used e-transfer to send him $3,300. But the contractor didn't get the money. I kind of panicked because uh, at this point, all, all, all $3,300 is gone from my account. I'm out $3,300. It was the beginning of a frustrating seven-month battle with his bank to try to get his money back. Eventually, TD told him someone hacked into his contractor's email and saw the e-transfer come in. Because Trudeau had asked an easy security question, the fraudster answered it correctly and redirected the money to another bank. A decision by TD's ombudsman says it was an email breach, therefore the bank did not err. Rene Trudeau is one of dozens of people who've contacted Go Public after losing money this way. Many saying they didn't realize their emails could be hacked or that they'd be on the hook if a fraudster correctly answered their security question. We've seen the ads where it says it's a safe way to send money. As with most banks, the fine print in TD's electronic agreement says customers using e-transfer must ask a strong security question that only the sender and receiver can answer. Also, it warns, do not send the answer via email. This cybercrime detective says financial institutions need to do a better job of letting customers using e-transfer know they have obligations if they want protection. They have a huge responsibility to their consumers. Um, you know, we're looking at people's uh, savings, people's pensions, people's investments. So I think they uh, should probably take the time and, and be more proactive. After Go Public contacted Trudeau's bank, TD and its customer worked out a deal. TD required the details to be kept confidential. Erica Johnson, CBC News, Vancouver. It looks beautiful out there right now. Uh, just looking out of the harbor cam. Now tomorrow's going to look a little bit different and we're in for a little bit of a wet week. I'll have all the details coming up.
All right, just before the break, taking a look at the harbor, you pointed out, <laughs> looks kind of nice out tomorrow, but different. Yeah, a little bit different. Uh, when you leave the house tomorrow, you may not need a jacket, but uh, certainly when you okay. come home, you will. We'll take a look at the temperatures. The, uh, the daytime highs for the metro era, really anywhere on the Avalon, will be in the morning, and then those temperatures are going to drop. That's what that asterisk there is. Uh, other than that, we will see some drizzle in the morning, and then we should see the sun peak out at times. Essentially across the board we'll see at some point we'll see some sunshine tomorrow some cloud cover will move back in late day with some rain and then that rain will continue uh, overnight and then this is a uh, Tuesday or tomorrow afternoon for Labrador as well 10 degrees for Lab City those temperatures significantly dropping uh, from what we saw today uh, Cartwright sitting at six degrees with some showers possible and then sunshine and 10 degrees for Nain. Now here's uh, what I was talking about as far as the rain. So some rain will move in Tuesday and then it's going to continue to push some more moisture through the day on Wednesday. So it's going to be pretty wet, some heavy rain at times, uh, essentially across the board or at least across the island. We'll start to see some of that rain push up through Labrador as well into the afternoon on Wednesday. And then we get back into that southerly flow. So a little bit of a push of some warmer air with this system as well. And that rain will continue right into Thursday morning at least the early half of uh, Thursday. So here's a look at those temperatures. Uh, so relatively warmer, 12 degrees, uh, 12 for Gander as well, 13 for Cornerbrook. But again, those gray skies will uh, stick with us through the day with that uh, showers and rain through the day as well. Happy Valley Goose Bay, 13 degrees, Nain 11 with plenty of sunshine through Wednesday and Lab City is going to hang on to that sunshine as well and 12 degrees. Now over the next couple of days, uh, temperatures will be sitting around seasonal, should be sitting around 14 degrees this time of year, uh, with again, showers really essentially continuing through Friday. As of now, it looks like Saturday should uh, see some sun sitting around 15 degrees through, uh, through the day. Now for uh, central Newfoundland, 14 degrees tomorrow, staying in those teen temperatures through Thursday and Friday. And then again, that sunshine on Saturday. Temperatures overnight, anywhere from 9 to 11 degrees. The coolest will be tomorrow night at 5 degrees. Now for Western Newfoundland, uh, rainy right through Friday. Again, that sunshine peaking out on Saturday. But temperatures really not moving much. A degree or two here and there. And then up through uh, Labrador, at least eastern, eastern portions of Labrador. Sunshine through Wednesday. And then we get into that uh, rainy weather. And that will take us through to Saturday. Overnight lows tomorrow night, two degrees. Uh, cool for Western Labrador as well tomorrow night, minus two. And then we get back into those single digits before Saturday rolls around. And then those overnight lows sitting around zero degrees for Saturday night. So that's a look at your forecast. I'll have a weather photo coming up. Thanks, Ashley. World leaders gathered at the United Nations in New York today for a summit on climate change. And this time, it was a meeting with a difference. Only countries proposing concrete action were allowed to speak. But their big promises and grand pledges, they were all drowned out by a single 16-year-old. As Stephen D'Souza reports, Swedish climate change activist Greta Thurberg took world leaders to task like no one before. I shouldn't be up here. I should be back in school on the other side of the ocean. Yet you all come to us young people for hope. How dare you? She's mobilized the world's youth, become the face of climate activism. You have stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words. And today on the floor of the United Nations, 16-year-old Greta Thunberg tore into world leaders. People are suffering. People are dying. Entire ecosystems are collapsing. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction, and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you? Excellencies. The Secretary General told countries they had to come here with concrete plans. Some, like Germany, promised to ban coal within a decade. Countries promised to be carbon neutral by 2050. But still, leaders acknowledged it wasn't going to be enough to stem rising global carbon emissions. My generation has failed in its responsibility to protect our planet. That must change. Thunberg didn't stop with the morning tongue lashing. Later, she joined other activists to file a complaint under the International Convention on the Rights of the Child, saying leaders had imperiled their future. 
We want change. Montreal's mayor addressed the summit today on the work cities are doing. She says Greta's message struck a chord. Ultimately, we need to think ahead of the future generation. And uh, as political leaders, this is what we should have in mind all the time, not only the today, but the future. But for all her passion, Thunberg's message didn't get through to everyone. President Donald Trump made just a brief appearance at the climate summit. Instead, he went to his own separate event on religious freedom, a snub that loomed large. The world is waking up. And change is coming, whether you like it or not. Thank you. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News at the United Nations. Well, to a different story now. It's an ingredient that is so special, international historians are studying it. A Yukon family has treasured their sourdough starter for more than a century, and these days they're helping out science while chowing down on their very unique bread. More from the CBC's Jane Sponagle. The fridge here. Ion Christensen is reaching for her famous sourdough there starter. It and it says, 100 year old sourdough, do not throw out. The reason I do that is because if we're going to, well, we don't go away in the holidays anymore, but if we, when we used to, and somebody's looking after the house, um, you don't want them cleaning out your fridge just before you come home and say, oh, yeah, that's a horrible looking thing. You know, it, it, it might not look like much, but the starter has been alive since the Klondike Gold Rush. Christensen's great grandfather had it with him when he arrived in Dawson City in 1898, and it's been in her family ever since. The, the expert, though, this is the, this is the nose, this is like the wine tasting, you know. Last year, Carl De Schmidt, the sourdough librarian, visited Christensen to get a sample of her starter. It was packed up and sent to the Parados Sourdough Library in Belgium. A series of tests were done, and now the results are back. De Schmidt says studying starters can help bakers make healthier and better tasting bread. She stores her sourdough in the fridge, and she's using it, from my understanding when I was there, to bake uh, waffles in the weekend. So she's not feeding every day her sourdough. One discovery, Christensen's starter is the most acidic in the collection. And when you keep a starter in the fridge, you give the microorganisms the time to acidify and acidify and acidify. DNA tests found three types of bacteria and one type of yeast. But it doesn't answer the question of where did the starter come from before Christensen's great-grandfather got it. She always thought he didn't bring it from New Brunswick, that he had, in fact, had probably picked it up with others at Dai when they were getting ready to come over the pass. And uh, so that sort of makes sense. I mean, I, I somehow just can't see, uh, you know, five men leaving home and saying, oh, we have to take our sourdough. There could be a connection to the California gold rush. As that boom died down, miners trekked to the Klondike in search of more gold and could have brought their sourdough with them. The yeast in Christensen sourdough is from the same genus as yeasts found in San Francisco starters. Uh, it's like saying it's a dog, but what kind of dog? It can be a German Shepherd or it can be a Chihuahua or uh, something in between. So to be sure that or to, to sh we, there's even tests that we could do further uh, in order to see if it's really the same DNA, DNA, DNA. Um, but there is some similarities. Christensen is happy to learn about the science of her prized starter, but she also remembers what's most important. We've talked so much about the sourdough. It's, um, it's all about the eating. <laughs> Jane Sponagle, CBC News, Whitehorse.
Welcome back. We're so engaged with the sourdough that uh, <laughs> didn't quite get to the picture. No, we didn't, and it's worth waiting for. Let's take a look at that photo. An absolutely stunning sunset. It is gorgeous. Isn't it? Any idea where that is? Probably not. That's a toughie. <laughs> They're all so tough. How are you supposed to guess? Uh, it was actually taken in South Dildo. Beautiful. Great shot. I just love the sunsets lately. Anywhere, uh, anywhere I've been so far, the sunsets in the last couple of days have been absolutely gorgeous. Yep. Wayne Noseworthy captured this stunning one uh, again in South Dildo. So thank you so much for sending that in. And if you have any weather photos that you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Beautiful shot, Wayne. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I'm still trying to get over the fact there's a starter library for <laughs> dough in Belgium. Isn't that neat? Yeah, I mean, an old container. Yeah, and I've never... Yeah, we got lots of those in the CBC fridge upstairs. <laughs> we should send them out for examination. I've never seen uh, sourdough waffles. That's kind of yeah. different. I like know. waffles? You like waffles? I love waffles. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, I love all food. We'll have those for breakfast <laughs> tomorrow, and we'll see you tomorrow night. <laughs> good night. Good night.